thank you all for for being here tonight and uh i hope you all are looking forward to this awesome poetry reading uh before we get started with tonight's um with tonight's reading i want to acknowledge our presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the gabrielino tongue peoples we acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism and genocidal practices as a literary arts organization, we're committed to uplifting indigenous communities, their stories and cultures. Beyond Baroque is a nonprofit literary arts center established here in Venice Beach in 1968. And we're dedicated to the artistic possibilities of language by cultivating new, new writing, presenting contemporary literature and art and building a diverse community of poets and writers. I wanna invite you all to join our mailing list and uh, stay tuned in uh, social media for any of our upcoming events, as well as our free weekly workshops in fiction and poetry. And please consider becoming a Beyond Broke member. Uh, the membership start as low as $50 and you're supporting directly our programming and continuing our, our efforts in, in providing uh, free events to, to the community. Um, in September, we're going to have a number of exciting readings, um, just like the one happening tonight. And in September, we're um, hosting Jack Skelly's new book launch, um, who will be joined by Beyond Broke friends like Amy Gersler and Benjamin Weissman, a reading with the fellows of the LA Institute for the Humanities, and a reading conversation with Tracy Kato Kiriyama and Noriko Nakata. So be on the lookout for those in our social media platforms and our website. Tonight's reading is one of those that, that's special because I'm sure some of you that are in the lineup thought might not happen. Um, it was postponed several times uh, and it's a COVID reality that we are in, but we want everybody to be as safe as possible. And I think it was worth the wait. So, um, yeah, and, and we can give a round of applause to all the all of the writers that are joining us tonight because um, it, it's pretty warm now and the heat is about to, to turn up. So I uh, hope you all are ready for it. And um, even the flyers that were posted by, by some of the features, uh, I, I really like Sarah's flyer with the UFO and and the newest one that you put out a few, few days ago. So, uh, Thank you for all the hype, you know? Um, so let's get, let's get started with it. Uh, first up is Kevin Richway. Kevin lives and writes in Long Beach. He's the author of the poetry collection, Too Young to Know. His work has appeared or is forthcoming in numerous collections, including Slipstream, San Pedro River Review, The Cape Rock, Spillway, Up the River, Home Planet News, Cultural Weekly, The American Journal of Poetry, and so it goes, the literary journal of the Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut Memorial Library, among many more. Let's give it up for Kevin Richway. Thank you very much. It's a very great honor to read here this evening with these poets. I'm gonna read a few selections from uh, my first collection of poetry. Uh, it's called Too Young to Know. The first poem is called Her Dead Husband's Ashes. She had told me about them, where she stored them, and I was perfectly fine with having him around. She had been gone for several days before I finally opened the drawer and pulled out the cardboard box that I opened. And there he was, a pile of gray sand I had heard so much about in her colorful stories that I got nervous as I said hello and introduced myself. I was lonely and he completely understood. He asked me for something to drink, so I got us some beers. We laughed and talked until sunrise. I got emotional about her, and he cheered me up by letting me sort through him in search of his remaining teeth. All was going well with us bachelors until the day the Neptune Society came and took him away to be scattered like all the other people I get too close to.
kamikaze summer. Early that last June of school, I received dozens of get well soon letters from classmates in response to a week earlier when I swallowed a bottle of sleeping pills that landed me in an adolescent psychiatric ward, flowers and great big stuffed animals waiting at the front hospital desk. I cannot remember much about that day other than all the revisions my suicide letter went through. And I nearly lost my nerve with Brian Wilson singing on top of a teenage symphony to God that made me dwell too much on small tragedies. And my brother flew out from New York City, not knowing what to say, while my teachers all felt sorry for me enough to pass me without completing my final exams and rumors that I was disfigured in my feeble attempt at death were quashed when I marched with a class of over 400 students at our commencement, still breathing, but just another lonely name they announced that hot afternoon that echoed off the bleachers of their football stadium before it rocketed beyond the clouds to the outer limits of uncertainty. This poem is called, I Survived Ikea, and all I got was this lousy poem. <laughs> My girlfriend called a cab when we were struggling to find the exit in a labyrinth assembled with the hallmarks of my Swedish heritage. Swedish Christmas songs blasting in my ears after I failed to finish my meatballs over lunch and started having the biggest panic attack of my life. She got me outside and held my hand on our way to the emergency room where a doctor told me that I had gravy on my mustache. I felt well enough to lick it off at that point and thanked him in the same fractured language my grandmother always spoke when she was too afraid to teach me how she climbed out of her pain long before her fire ever went out and when we were unable to reassemble her so we could feel safe enough to reassemble ourselves. Here's my one COVID poem for the evening. Quarantine number nine. I am in a screaming match with the motherfucker next door. Both of us mad dogging each other from windows in lockdown houses across from each other, bored and paranoid and half naked. We promise each other if the world doesn't come to an end, we are going to fuck each other up because my Amazon Prime order was delivered to him by mistake. And to be extra careful, he will not give it to me because of the possibility of spreading infection. And I can swear I hear him watching the movies I ordered for myself as a way to escape from assholes like him. The Death of the Copper Tone Girl. The billboard stood above Interstate 5, and it featured a pretty cartoon girl with her bikini bottoms tugged down in a mechanical tug of war with a cartoon dog, which showed off the tan line of her pale derriere. She lost one of her legs during a storm that left the dog decapitated. They both stood there until the bitter end when they disappeared and the sign turned into a large ad that read, shop at Walmart. And I grieved the loss of the first woman I fell in love with and could not save. My father never taught me anything. My father never taught me anything, 
other than how to saw women in two with electric charisma that leaves us both daydreaming in separate prisons and all of them dying while waiting for us to join them on the outside. He taught me how to break hearts by way of the art of self-destruction. He taught me how to rob, cheat, and steal the pants off anyone I could manipulate. He never taught me how to drive a car or how to ride a bike or how to fish. I looked in his dusty dresser drawers for artifacts that he left behind. His 1983 wardrobe and his last pack of camel non-filters, half of it smoked on the day he was captured, the other half brittle with straws of tobacco, which tasted like a very bitter kind of silly string that is anything but silly and is killing him as he battles lung cancer in prison. He taught me the power of mystery and the art of disappearing, but it has all gone down like a movie. One big mushroom cloud of devastation as we drift further into the darkness that my father taught me. Getting high with mom and dad. My mother started to look and talk like a melting Salvador Dali painting when my father came to in hand-me-down David Koresh eyeglasses. My mother held the pot smoke in her lungs and passed the lit joint to my father. He let my mother shotgun clouds of weed smoke in the middle of a kiss. And before I knew it, they both agreed how trippy it was that I came from my father's testicles. They bushwhacked and zoned out while they tripped out and fingered the curly hair of my long beard to hide a baby face they grew nostalgic about. My mother started laughing because she thought my face looked like a vagina. The high soon wore off and we were awkward and distant with each other all over again. My mother asked me at one point if I had any more weed. I lied when I told her no. I'll do three more poems here. Um, this poem is called The Naked Kid. It's hot in here, huh? I sat there in my quiet dorm room, alone and unpopular, listening to Kurt Cobain's apologetic scream recorded as it burned out and left my ears at the mercy of the voices of three nerds right outside my room in a never ending game of Dungeons and Dragons that made me regret my decision to get a higher education up there in the Green Mountains, far away from everyone and everything I'd known. The returning students gawked in disgust at me and laughed at me when I slipped onto my ass in my attempts to maneuver the slick ice in the wrong shoes. I climbed out of my fear one night and I slid on the ice on my ass in search of what became my first college party. The coconut rum splashed against my chapped lips and it boiled my throat enough so I would no longer hide. I got drunk enough to join a naked man who was playing a flute. His jazz flourishes roused me into an infamous full Monty. I threw my boxers into the crowd and girls took turns waving them in the air until they were shit-faced enough to get naked and join me in my victory dance. The band made the night even more dangerous in a desperate haunted sonic midnight cloud with the cover of Gimme Shelter. And for the first time in my life, I suddenly knew every single word to the song that forced me out of hiding long enough to surround me with people who became lifelong friends who are always just a shout away. Time is running out and there's no happiness. 
His regret left fears on the first page of his letter on prison stationery, guilty for not being there for me and for being an asshole who only cared about drugs. He lost my mother forever, and he and I nearly lost each other during a time of silence when he saved my life from becoming cold and bitter. That's when he told me that I was the greatest thing to ever come out of his and my mother's love. Misspelled words that saved my life out here with the burden of freedom in pursuit of an elusive happiness beyond the prison walls that hide him from me and me from him as I decide to give us both another chance. Okay, this is my last poem for the evening. It's called My Girlfriend Kissed Mr. Rogers. <laughs> he was the first man I trusted and loved in the wake of my father's disappearance from my life. He wore a cardigan I envied. He was a smooth operator who never let me down and her loving spirit complimented his as they killed everyone with the same relentless kindness that killed them both. She embraced the gentle public television star on stage after he spoke at her college graduation. And she whispered lusty poetry into his ear before she surprised him with a kiss. They were joined together in a force field of an electric goodness so potent they could have used it to save the world. She left me for Mr. Rogers, who she followed into a cosmic neighborhood, somewhere in a great beyond where they earned an impossible sainthood. The compassionate lip lock she initiated years ago still haunts my wildest daydreams, where I can hear her whisper, won't you be mine? Thank you. Kevin Richway, thank you so much for joining us. Um, that IKEA poem just made me rem I remember that. That's, that's my Sunday plans, uh, building some furniture, but Thank you for the poems, even like finding some joy uh, in these COVID times. Um, really glad, glad to have you open the, the reading tonight. Um, next up, I uh, wanna bring to the stage Sarah Lisbon. Zara is a writer of fiction and poetry. She grew up in Venice, California, has a BA in English from Loyola Marymount University and an MFA in creative writing from Vermont College of Fine Arts. She has published poetry and short fiction in La Miscellany, Attic Salt, Fourth Magazine, Able Muse, and Cheap Pop Lit, to name a few. Fake Plastic World is the sequel to her first novel, Fake Plastic Girl, and Baby's First Apocalypse, which is right here, um, and we have it available at the bookstore, uh, is her first book of poetry. So let's give it up for Sarah. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for coming, everybody. Um, I have wanted to read poetry here since I was a little kid. Um, I have a memory of my dad had an art show upstairs and it was just like pouring rain and me and my friends were playing outside in the rain. And I thought how cool it would be to have my own thing here one day. And so it is kind of insane to actually be here. Um, and Kevin, I am uh, looking for some new furniture and thank you for reminding me not to go to Ikea to get it. Um, I literally was just thinking Ikea or Target. Now I know my answer. So thank you. <laughs> um, okay. This first one is called Core. Should I get drunk and put together a poem about how much I hate the word poetry and its inability to cover ground. I will drink to feel clean and tell you about how I am made up of all these metal pieces fused together at the joints, covered in satin, and how this makes me feel ridiculous. Ridiculous and exposed and curious about myself for the first time. 
Like it's only just now occurring to me that I've been alive all along. A marionette created in the imagination of a megalomaniac genius, but alive. I've been thinking of buying a stripper pole for my room just so I can try to find my core. And then what? I will find it and open the little metal door that leads to the center of me and find that it's only magnets and light. I've been thinking of you and magnets and how one sentence doesn't need to relate to the next in order for it to count as a poem. How one sentence doesn't need to relate to the next in order for it to count as a conversation. This is called Girls of the Pacific Northwest, and it is a tribute to Laura Palmer of Twin Peaks. I don't know if we have any Twin Peaks fans out there, but um, okay. I saw my blood, deep crimson blue, laid out before me in seven test tubes, like maraschino and grenadine on cocktail night, like the lips of whores I've wanted to be. I saw you staring, hollow-eyed from across the room, bent and brooding in the pain of daylight, your skin frosted over as a mausoleum, your mouth a succulent fruit broken open. You were conditioned to stillness. The stillness became you, and you became its loyal servant, an owl caught in a ring of trees. I triggered something in you. I didn't mean to pull that trigger. I didn't mean to turn you on or to turn on you, but it was too easy. All it took was being human. All it took was being pure, the purest of the pure through your eyes. You didn't know the sins I collect like pearls. Your teeth were not the first to venture beneath my flesh. You were not the first to drink me colorless. Like a burning flickering beacon, I attract the darkness. It has fed on me since I was 12, entering through my open window each night, disguised as a derelict lover, covered in ash, missing teeth. He took my smile for his collection of polished trinkets, blackened my lips, yellowed my teeth. Then all I was was solid twilight. Then all I could do was wait for death disguised as a suburban father to take me away from myself. I saw my blood, deep crimson blue, splattered across the rusted walls of an abandoned train, and you were there with my smile in your hands, ready to wrap me up in plastic. some stuff going on with my dog involved. That's okay. <laughs> He's always causing trouble. Um, okay. This is a really strange one for me because I wrote it when I was 18 and I was, uh, I had just gotten my wisdom teeth out and I was um, on Oxycontin and I, I just thought I've not, I had never written a poem like it before and I've never since, and it just happened. I don't even remember it happening. I, I, it just happened. Um, so it's called the Oxycontin Moonlight of a Window Rippled Street Lamp. The first of two dozen gold balloons sinks to the floor at 12 o'clock the morning after and echoing from the open door, the ghosts of self-negligent children and their drunken laughter dancing around the floor of a champagne wet new year in a room that is only the memory of a wooden gazebo in the rain. They write their names into the foggy glass, trying only to see clear, Alice in Wonderland, Wizard of Oz, and whatever happened to baby Jane. The first one to be smashed said, don't worry. She said, I'm not a glass of orange juice. I won't spill. I said, that's good. But this one thought is too big for my entire body. So tonight, I definitely will. When Los Angeles overdoses on some numbing pill and a glimpse of cold generates through the city 
and no concern, the children are thrilled and the dark settles in, but the darkness is pretty. It makes me think of falling in love, but nothing yet very certain as the Oxycontin moonlight of a window rippled street lamp, street lamp gushes in through the green winter curtains. Your anesthetic left me with the yearn for certain burns and in an infatuation with every moment's bleeding screen. <laughs> That's my dad. <laughs> um, okay, um, this one is based on a true story. Um, it's called Diet Coke. Does anybody want this bottle of Diet Coke? I bought it by accident. I wanted a regular Coke, actually. But there is absolutely nothing wrong with this bottle of Diet Coke. It has a silvery label decorated simply with a snowflake and a polar bear. And I'm sure I'd drink it if I hadn't been raised not to touch the stuff, the neurotoxins and the sugar stand-ins. If at night you pulled out a tooth and put it in a bottle of Diet Coke, by morning, the tooth would be dissolved. But you won't be pulling out any teeth and leaving them in this bottle overnight, so you should be fine. You will survive this bottle of Diet Coke. I didn't think I was the kind of girl to write a poem about Diet Coke, but there, I did it. Um, this is also uh, segueing into my COVID poems. Um, which I think I have two of. Apocalypse currently. Too much shame to unravel, blue sea glass in gravel. I start to think in stanzas whenever it rains. Only safe in pajamas, my new pathology. Honey bunches of oats, the best plan to kill me slow. I walk for hours wondering if my life is really my own. The houses in West Hollywood with yards and gates and big TV glow. I am an adult now, so. Okay, this is called The Best Sellers. Okay, studies show that people want to read about human closeness, shared bonds, intimacy, they want to read about marriage, death, taxes, and technologies. Kids, doctors, moms, media, work, school, presidents, newspapers, funerals, and guns. They want to read about the average home. They want to read about the stock market, laboratories, spirituality, and college. They want to read about dogs. Studies show that people do not want to read about seduction, cigarettes, alcohol, or revolutions. They do not want to read about sojourns, dinner parties, playing cards, or very dressed up women. They do not want to read about the gods. They do not want to read about wheeling and dealing, graphic sex, drugs, or rock and roll. They do not want to read about worship or witches. They do not want to read about the human body unless it is at a crime scene. Studies show that best-selling characters express their needs. Wants are good too, but needs are even better. Best-selling characters grab, do, think, ask, look, hold, love, tell, like, see, hear, smile, reach, pull, push, start, work, know, arrive, spend, walk, pray, hug, talk, read, imagine, decide, believe, love, hate, see, stare, scream, shove, miss, eat, nod, open, close, say, sleep, type, watch, turn, Run, shoot, kiss, die. Studies show that characters who don't sell tend to shout, fling, whirl, thrust, murmur, protest, hesitate, accept, dislike, seem, suppose, recover. They tend to grunt, clutch, peer, gulp, tremble, cling, jerk, shiver, break, fumble, fling. They tend to begin, accept, remark, exclaim, mutter, answer, protest, address, shout, demand, and speak. Hey, 
And this is the last one. Um, it was this cover. Well, it was a, inspired by the, the cover um, or the cover was inspired by the poem. I, it, the poem is about the night that this cover, picture was taken. Let's put it that way. Um, walking home alone in a pandemic. The first night I walked home alone in a pandemic, it didn't occur to me that it would be any different from the other nights walking home alone with my dog at my side and my wits about me. But it was midnight between Friday and Saturday and there was absolutely nobody on the streets. No cars on the road, no noise to be heard, except for the orchestra of crickets, the water fountains in front lawns gurgling and hidden. I listened for the sound of telephone wires whispering clues like sort of soda poured over ice, but even they didn't know what the fuck was going on. A silent city, a shut in city, a city locked down. I walked from Romaine onto Crescent Heights thinking never before in history have the streets of Los Angeles known such stillness. Suburbia grade stillness, rural grade stillness, Santa Monica Boulevard with its lights out, jaywalking because I could, because it was easy, because it would have been stupid not to. A world put on hold, suspended in time, kind of like I'd always wanted. The streets were dead, but the air was alive with electrons and smelled clean. Not like the calm before the storm, but the calm right after. And I made myself promise I'd remember it forever. Will we get into trouble when we think time belongs to us, when we think we can hold on? I miss every moment as soon as it's gone. Thank you. Zara Lisbon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zara. Uh, we got back to back beach poets. Um, and thank you for that poem of, uh, you know, how this. That poem probably inspired the uh, the cover of your book. And also, before I forget, um, also wanted to show uh, Kevin Richray's book, I like the cover too. Kind of like it's like a hacker vibe to it, and <laughs> could be called the hacker poems. But it's rejection letters and uh, with Arroyo Seco Press and Baby's First Apocalypse was by Luchador Press. So um, check them out at the bookstore. But um, our, our next poet is, uh, uh, is such an amazing poet, um, sold out of a lot of his books. I don't think we have some tonight, but um, still you will, you will get to hear an amazing reading. Uh, Jose Hernandez Diaz is a 2017 NEA Poetry Fellow. He's the author of The Fire Eater and his works appears in the American Poetry Review, uh, Boulevard, Colorado Review, Wisache, Iowa Review, the Southern Review, the Yale Review, and in the Best American Non-Required Reading Anthology of 2011. He teaches creative writing online, edits for Frontier Poetry, and for the past few months now, he's been a facilitator of our infamous Wednesday Night Poetry Workshop, um, which I think there's some Wednesday Night uh, Poetry folks here. Awesome, thank you. So, um, thank you. Thank you so much for that, and let's give it up for Jose Hernandez Diaz. <laughs> So uh, thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, I've been wanting to read here for a couple of years and um, thank you. Thank you. And I was supposed to read it in 2020 for the launch of the Fire Eater, but um, obviously COVID happened. And um, 10 years ago or so, I used to volunteer here for, with the uh, poets in the schools, with high school students, working with high school students. And uh, I had a lot of like social anxiety. So I ended up dropping out of that, but um, it was a good experience. I liked being here. Um, it was great to see a place in LA County that, you know, that supported literature where I come from. Um, you know, I don't get a lot of support for my writing and I feel isolated a lot, often trying to talk to librarians who are not interested in talking to me about it. And um, so it was just like, wow, there's a spot for, for literature, you know, and it was just, so it's, it's a, such a profound space for me. And uh, I'm going to start off um, by reading new poems because I've been reading the fire read of the past couple of years. So I'm going to be reading from my phone so as not to use paper. Uh, the first one is called Portrait of the Artist as a Brown Man. 
obviously from the uh, Joyce reference. Um, a few years ago, I was in the same library in the same quiet upper middle class town I didn't live in. I just finished writing a prose poem that would eventually get published in the nation, Writer's High. Then a white lady came up to me and asked about the trash. I was confused until I realized she thought I was a janitor because of my brown skin. So that's a short one. That's, that's actually a true story too. So um, the Cerritos library that happened. And um, yeah. And uh, this next one is called The Pocha with the Adelita Tattoo. And uh, it's forthcoming in Honey Literary. Can you hear me good or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I fell in love with the pocha with the Adelita tattoo. She's so cultured and idiosyncratic. Her hair is up in a bun. She wears heels with blue jeans, red lipstick. Her tattoo is Dia de los Muertos and Mexican revolutionary themed. Her eyes are pocha light brown, like honey. I don't know if she speaks Spanish. If she does, it's probably broken like mine. The pocha with an Adelita tattoo and I go out on a date to a local taco shop. We talk about music, art, and poetry. We have a few cocktails and eat tacos. At the end of the night, I ask her about her tattoo. She says she got it because it represents her Mexican heritage and because Las Adelitas were badass women. I tell her it's lovely and lean in for a kiss. And uh, th that's from uh, my forthcoming, thank you. That's from my forthcoming collection, uh, Bad Mexican, Bad American. I think all of these are, I oh, know I have some from another collection called The Lighthouse Tattoo that I wrote this year. And that's, uh, I'm still submitting that. This next one is called um, Dreams of Conquest. And it was published in the Indianapolis Review. I've been having a recurring dream of Hernan Cortez and Cuauhtémoc fighting it out with swords and macawiros and shields. My therapist tells me she thinks I'm trying to make sense of my culture and the world at large as if life should be fair. Fair enough, I tell her, but I don't care who wins anymore. I've had enough. I'm 37. I just want the fighting to stop. Why can't they just play chess, I tell her. What about a friendly game of basketball or that famous Aztec pelota game? No, wait, someone always dies in that game too. I don't wanna be obsessed with death anymore, I tell her. I just want to laugh, paint, and enjoy the California weather. As far as dreams go, I tell her, I'd be fine if I just slept through the night. Thank you. So I've been working, doing a lot of um, generative workshops, working with um, online writing organizations. And I've been writing prompts and then responding to it by writing poems. And this one came out of a prompt that, that um, said, write about feeling trapped and uh, how do you escape from that? And how do you acquire a sense of freedom? And it's called the British Fondus and it's forthcoming in Puerto del Sol. I'm stuck inside one of those old red British phone booths from the past. In fact, the only time I hear about phone booths nowadays is when I'm watching boxing and the announcer says, it's been one hell of a phone booth fight. Outside of the phone booth is rain and fog. No one notices me inside the phone booth. Maybe I like it after all. Nevertheless, I pick up the phone to call for help. My mother answers on the other line in California. Try to smash the glass with your fist, she says. I smash the glass and London fog bleeds into the booth. I crawl out of the phone booth like a snake. I transform into a Shakespearean marionette, tights, trunks, facial hair and all. I recite the famous sonnets to the eager crowd that is gathered, invisible again. I take a bow. I haven't read in person in a while, so I'm kind of tripping out on that. Um, used to read it in my room by myself to my dog. This next one is also, is actually forthcoming in a Sokolo Public Square. 
It's called the Palm Tree Piñata. And I wrote it to another prompt that I wrote for a class and it was um, right about smashing a piñata and, and what happened, something like that. I'm smacking around a piñata shaped like a palm tree. It is Southern California, midsummer. The palm tree piñata is swinging back and forth beneath the bright summer sun. It is my birthday. I'm 37, 38 years old. I don't always act my age, yet I am wise beyond my years, people say. We're having a party to celebrate. A few of my childhood friends are in attendance and many Mexican cousins. We are drinking a mixture of Mexican beers, trendy hard seltzers and sangria. Finally, I give, finally, I give the palm tree piñata a final smack and it explodes. Out of the piñata comes falling loteria game sets and Mexican dulces. I pick up a dulce and start chewing. As the sun sets on the West Coast, we play rancheras, cumbias, hip hop, and oldies. Well into the night, the moon rises with the cigarette smoke. So I got two more. Um, it's great to see some folks from the Wednesday workshop here. Um, yeah, we've become like a family, so it's a really cool experience. Um, this next one I'm gonna read is called The Stranger, and it was published in the Yale Review. A man came up to me as I was walking home from the pharmacy. Are you Jose Hernandez Diaz? Yes, I said, who's asking? Do you enjoy sipping tea before bedtime? Well, I do, but what is it to you, I asked. In the ninth grade, did you get cut from the basketball team? I did in fact get cut from the team. Do you sometimes wonder what life would have been like had you married Margot Cisneros? Maybe sometimes, yes, I said. Are you afraid of small talk and long walks in the city? I'm just a little introverted, I said. Does the night sky resemble the dragon of your dreams? Yes, thank you for asking, I said. Did you cry when Muncie hit that home run in the World Series? I did cry at that moment, proud of it. Were you born and raised back and forth from LA and Orange County? Story of my life, yes, I said. Does the night sky resemble a dragon of your dreams? Yes, thank you for asking, yes. I, thank you, thank you. I thought I would end with this one that I just got, I just got contributor copies of Conduit when I got home today and I've been trying to get in there for a while and there's sort of an edgy magazine that, that James Tate was in and Ray Gonzalez and a lot of my idols. So this is what it's called voice. A man in a Carlos Santana shirt looked for his voice beneath the pile of crisp autumn leaves, nothing. He looked for his voice at an underground rooster fight, nothing. The man in a Carlos Santana shirt picked up a bulldog puppy and looked for his voice inside of the dog's mouth, nothing. Finally, the man in a Carlos Santana shirt saw a used black guitar in a thrift store window. He purchased the guitar with his last few dollars. The man turned the guitar, sorry, the man tuned the guitar and began to play a bolero. His voice was there, as it turns out, inside of the guitar sound hole. It had been there all along. Thank you. Jose Hernandez Diaz, everyone. Yeah. Any poets out there want to workshop a piece, you know where to be at. Um, Zoom, 8 p.m. Every, every Wednesday night. Um, thank you. And, and congrats on that uh, last poem that you read um, being published in, in an anthology of poets you've been reading for a long time. It's, it's always an honor. Um, last but not least, um, our poet ending the reading tonight is uh, Matthew Caillé. Matthew is the author, author of six books. His short stories, poems, and essays have appeared in numerous national and international publications, most notably in the Saturday Evening Post and the LA Times. He is the recipient of a Shakespeare Award, a Short Story America Prize, and a New England Book Festival Award. Heaven and Other Zip Codes, his debut novel and most recently published book, has been hailed as a po postmodern masterpiece by the mid uh, by the Midwest Book Review. 
and was named the winner of the 2021 LA Book Festival. Congrats. Uh, let's give it up for Matthew Kaya. So hot, I just peeled off the wood chair. That was good. Hi, everybody. Thank you to Yvonne and Jimmy for having us. It's really great to be here. Can you hear me okay? Got the mask sweat going, hold on. Oh, that's better. All right. Yeah, I don't, you know, the last reading I did was in January of 2020. So I don't know if I can remember how to read in public, but we'll see. And um, it's just something that I kind of took for granted that they would always be there. And they haven't been. So this, the value of being in a room with so many like-minded folks who inspire me is it's not lost on me, you know? So thank you, Jose, Zara, Kevin. I'm really honored to work with you all. Some days I don't feel like writing and uh, I get up in the morning and I'll see like Jose's Twitter or Kevin's poems or Zara's work. And I'm inspired to keep going and, you know, to, I say, well, somewhere they're working, so I should do the same. So um, I appreciate it. I'm going to read uh, from my first poetry collection just to start us off. Um, when I was in high school, there was a teacher of mine named Mr. Devine who had a, maybe like many classrooms, had a skeleton in the back of the room, like to teach, you know, anatomy or whatever the hell he was teaching. I didn't pay attention too much. You'll see in the poem. And um, I was really intrigued by the skeleton because I would go over and touch it a lot and think like, I think it's real, you know? I didn't know anything, but it felt really real. It didn't feel like plastic. And I thought about that skeleton all the time. Probably why the grade wasn't so good, but here we go. So this is biology in room 13C. The 15 year old student in room 13C isn't paying attention to his biology teacher, Mr. Larson. Sure, the student hears his teacher's words, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, but they just flit across his gray matter like thoughts of Cindy McGinnis his lab partner with the dangling braids and Cheeto orange fingers. Now the student stares past Mr. Larson at the human skeleton in the corner of the room. Those bones, he knows, aren't made of plastic or of some composite material. They are real bones. The student has run his hands over them, felt the dryness. He has even wedged his fingers into the teeth when Mr. Larson was sick and a substitute had lost control. The student wonders about the skeleton, who he was. He wonders why he's so sure the skeleton was a man. Skeletons just always look like men, he thinks. The skeleton is short, very short and thin, but all skeletons are thin, right? They can't show any weight. The student doesn't think so, but he's not sure of much in room 13C. He has an F, maybe an F plus after today's quiz. He got a good look at Cindy's paper when she dropped her pen. Maybe the skeleton used to be a jockey, race in the Kentucky Derby and ride a horse named Baby Lulu. And here comes baby Lulu down the back stretch. It's baby Lulu fighting for position with here comes the bride. It's baby Lulu. Here comes the bride, baby Lulu. Here comes the bride. And there it is. Baby Lulu sneaks in by a flared nostril. Was the skeleton lonely? The student wonders. Did his molars loosen from nighttime grinding and the constant torment of winding up alone and eating leftover meatloaf on Thanksgiving? Did the skeleton leave money in the collection basket at church? Did he wear bow ties? Was he a surf and turf guy? How did he like his steak prepared? Did the skeleton have children? And if so, what kind of children donated their father to room 13C? Was there paperwork for that sort of thing? Did the children get to state what kind of school they wanted their father to join? Was air conditioning a factor? Quality of the students, the classroom teacher? Was this Mr. Larson's father? The student thinks maybe he passed the skeleton at some point, it's possible. When the student was five, maybe he was shushed by this man at the local library. He was shushed a lot as a kid. Perhaps the student's parents invited the skeleton to their house to play mahjong. The student's parents really loved mahjong, still do. The skeleton looked so sweet to the student. The big cavities where his eyes used to sit gape open and honest. He looks like his name is Horace. It's like he's in a permanent Halloween costume, smirking as he opens the door with a bucket full of baby Ruths. The student hopes it ended peacefully for the skeleton, not in a hospital bed surrounded by beeps and monitors, but in his home with his wife Marge by his side. The student hopes they shared a swell dinner the night before, 
a Caesar salad, some chicken cordon bleu, a bowl of rice pudding sprinkled with golden raisins and extra cinnamon. Is this hell? Did Horace cook the books and scam the poor and bathe in money? Maybe the underworld isn't hot and fiery with horns and pitchforks and all that red. Maybe it's Mr. Larson with a tweed blazer, pocket protector, and heavy pit stains rambling on about cytokinesis. Is this how the skeleton saw it all unfold when he was a kid in Baltimore delivering newspapers on his red bike, dreaming of going to the majors and taking his girlfriend out for clams over Memorial Day weekend? Did he think he'd end up in the dusty corner of the room, naked, surrounded by spotted composition books and a fire extinguisher? Maybe the skeleton wanted to give himself to science when he was handsome and 50, drafting his will in a wood paneled office, but now wishes he'd join Marge six feet under in a nearby cemetery where they could enjoy the soft sun and the afternoon shade of an elm. Does the skeleton now wish he'd gone in another direction, held a ceremony on manicured grass, and had his sons tossed handfuls of dirt onto his varnished casket? Did he think it through? Does he hate being epitaphless? Does he wish he'd given his family a proper way of saying goodbye? Does he regret not having his moment of, oh, Danny boy, piped into the wind? Or is Mr. Larson's anatomy unit towards the end of February enough to keep him going? Thank you. I can still read. Barely. Okay, this is the, the newer book. A poem for Pablo Neruda. In my 20s, I visited Santiago with the hope of touring your famous home, La Chascona. But when I arrived, the line was long and packed and as serpentine as the Chilean coast. So instead, I opted to spend time with a woman I'd met the night prior. We strolled La Calle de Santa Julia, shared hand-rolled cigarettes, and exhaled, span exhaled plenty of Spanish sweet nothings. I apologize, dear Pablo, but you, of all people, I'm sure can understand. Emojis are ruining the world. I worry that the more we use happy faces, eggplants, balloons, and thumbs up, the more we revert back to hieroglyphics, the more we pass on articulating sentiment press pictures instead of swirling in their meaning. The more emojis pepper our prose, the more we use different colored hearts, the more our real ones, all four chambers of them, begin to atrophy. This password. Sorry, your password does not contain one of the following. Your password must include a capital letter, two numbers, an exclamation point, a decimal, an M dash, three ampersands, the initials of your high school crush, the code from your first bike lock, a Van Halen reference, a Shakespearean sonnet, a biggie verse, a symbol from the periodic table, the latitude of your first kiss, the longitude of your last one, an introspective look at Plato's apology. Your driver's license number divided by 12, Maya Angelou's birthday, Rumi's favorite number, the amount of eggs in your grandma's bundt cake, the dollar amount left by the tooth fairy for your first molar, a Bible verse from Corinthians, the waist size of your father's lees, your grandfather's diastolic blood pressure, your heart rate when you lost your virginity, your high score on Ms. Pac-Man, the number of brooches owned by your mother, the size of the first bra you unhooked, the highway on which you received your first DUI, the amount of times you bought flowers instead of apologizing, the post postal address of the first house you ate, the number of ingredients in that special barbecue rub, the horsepower of a 65 Thunderbird, the number of, pa white, <laughs> the number of pages in white fang, the GPA of that foreign exchange student you cheated off of in math class, the ring size of your ex-wife, the day she began to feel unloved, the time of day she called and said she wanted to meet at the park, the sum of money her macchiato clock cost, the time she took in seconds to tell you she no longer loved you, the speed at which she pulled away from the curb, the number of times you've thought about her since. Sorry, your password does not contain one of the following. Please try again. Sorry, that exceeds three attempts. Please try again later. 
Thank you. All right, this one, I read this really cool article in The Guardian a few years ago about um, like endangered languages, languages that are spoken. I think there's a definition of like fewer than a hundred people and there's like a significant amount of them. And I read the article like 40 times trying to see if I could figure out a way to kind of put them into a poem. So this is called Passing Tongues. One, the dying language is Kalawea from South America. Bolivia, to be exact. High in the thin air of the Andes, the Kalawea people see the benefits of compromise, speaking Spanish to feign peace with modernity. Yet in private, the Kalawea use their own tongue, only passed in secret by men. And while their skills as herbalists and healers are renowned throughout the region, no salve nor tree root can curb the dwindling demise, time withering the tribe to now fewer than 100. Two, Yuchi is spoken by the Yuchi people. Originally from Tennessee, they were relocated to dusty Oklahoma in the late 1800s. Forced to attend government schools, the Yuchi children had to do without their native roots, beaten whenever comfortable speech slid from their lips. The dialect has 10 genders, including three for inanimate objects, but only five remaining speakers. Three, Kugu Yudihir, a language born and raised in Queensland, Australia. James Cook encountered more than just miles of sharp coasts and rocky reefs when he explored Australia in 1770. Taking note of a few words from the Gugu Yudihir, the Northern Aboriginal people. The most famous world, word scrawled in Cook's journal is still one we use today, kangaroo though Cook spelled it Kunguru. The tongue is now spoken by only 200 people as it is continually rejected in favor of English. Four, Tofa hails from Siberia, the land of stretching tundra, dark timber, and the world's deepest lake. The language was developed miles from the Arctic Circle as an efficient way of communicating complex reindeer herding directions. For example, condensing a male domesticated reindeer in its third year and first mating season, but not ready for mating to just Dungur. Tofa is now moribund, the young preferring Russian. Only 30 people still hold Tofa's power. Akajera, five. Akajera is not taught in schools nor AP classes. It's words distant from Rosetta Stone programs and SAT tests just the oldest and continuously used language on the planet. From the Andaman Islands and the Indian Oceans dating to the Neolithic era some 8,000 years ago, these people whose native tongue decays each day live isolated, 200 miles from the Asian mainland, their beats and inflections of little relation to other. This once thriving culture, now a tiny tribe of only 40 people. Six. Numut Ote, a language from Mexico, where a married couple from the southern state of Tabasco, Manuel Segovia and Isidro Velasquez, are the only people on the globe who can utter the words of a language that literally means true voice. The lone pair to pass their voices back and forth, everything a code, everything a secret. Seven. These languages now ebb like Amazonian rainforests, red pandas and cross river gorillas, vowels, consonants, diphthongs and syllables, centuries of hellos, goodbyes, good nights, and I love you, all last words, their rhythms and cadences, nothing more than fluttering passenger pigeons. Thank you. And my last poem. Everything I learned about love, I learned from the couple across the street. In apartment 5C, who never closed their blinds the entire time I lived in Brooklyn, who slow danced weekly, drank percolator coffee each morning, and shared a croissant, made cocktails for one another, her gin and tonic, him seven and seven, read the newspaper in bed, retrieved fallen duvets, dressed up to play cards with their friends, studied old photos, 
applied balm to each other's backs, cut up melon during summer and ate it over the sink, trimmed each other hair, each other's hair, her, bangs, him, beard, built fires, argued but forgave, hugged even within the hour, FaceTimed with their grandkids, made fresh lemonade and did the crossword, fed pigeons, enjoyed Columbo, hid cigarettes from each other, her under the sink, him at the back of the sock drawer, washed and dried dishes together, watered bromeliads, threw each other birthday parties, her March 1st, him December 20th, bought a pet fish, purchased swap meat paintings, wrote holiday cards, folded each other's laundry, cleaned one another's dentures, called doctors, picked up pills, set alarms to give her pills, sat with her each day, called loved ones to say their goodbyes, invited a rabbi to whisper the Kaddish, hugged hospice workers, kept the funeral flowers for a week, hung a photo of her on the mantel wall, donated her clothing, donated the bed, slept on the couch thereafter. Thank you. Matthew Kaye, and shout out to all the poets tonight. Uh, round of applause, round of applause. Um, you can check out uh, Matthew's book, uh, as well as Zara's and um, Kevin's book in the bookstore. Uh, we'll be closing it at 10 p.m. Um, so there's plenty of time if you wanna um, check out the bookstore. And also we have a gallery upstairs uh, that you're welcome to, um, to, to see. And um, we also have snacks, there's refreshments, feel free to, to mingle and really a, a big shout out to, to the poets and thank you for um, being persistent and like, um, and seeing this, this reading and really to, uh, to Zara and, and to Jose that um, I think, is this the first time that you were also reading here? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And, and also Jose, so we'd love to see you all again and um, thank you. Thank you really. So enjoy. Thank you.